Welcome to What If So What, the podcast where we ask what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real in your business. I'm Jim Hertzfeld. And I'm Kim Chopek. We're part of Proficient's digital strategy team. And today we'll ask what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Hey, everyone. And uh, hey, Kim, it's just you and I today with an old fashioned season recap episode. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Jim. It's it's exciting to think that we are recapping season two. Yeah, yeah. I um and I love that um, you know, we tried to find a story arc, right? As we called it. You know, this this is a, as we opened the season a couple months ago, talking about one of our what we've termed as a white noise word around strategy. What is it? And um we have a perspective on that. I think we tried to find some of that today in this recap and throughout the season. But maybe let's just go back and talk about the guests that we had in this search for strategy. Yeah. We talked about a few what ifs, like what if, what if we could speak marketing and IT with Robert Nelms from Assurant. We talked about leading digital natives as a digital immigrant with uh, Lisa Bowman at Marketing Mojo. We talked about never having to go to your doctor's office again with Tom Swanson mm-hmm. at Adobe, the, you know, sort of this convergence of the personal and professional brand with Kelsey Flora meeting your clothes maker, Sean Reynolds at Legility. That was fascinating. Uh, what those guys are doing. And of course, reinventing retail with John Gregory at Spotify, uh, who will be on again, I believe. Like we have a lot more to talk about just around podcasts with John. So a lot of fun. I really enjoyed listening to the episodes and um, and this sort of st- search for this, this strategy story. You know, this is a podcast uh, about digital primarily, but we're strategists and that take started to resonate. So Kim, when we go back and reflect on where we open the season, like maybe you can give, give us kind of a reminder about what were the sort of foundational parts of strategy that we were looking for? Yeah, such a great group of guests. And I, I know I learned just a ton. And it, when it comes to digital and digital strategy, I think every guest had their own perspective on you know, what it takes, what's working, what's not working, and how we really have to evolve. But this notion of strategy in general kept coming up. So I think the first thing that we heard is strategy isn't what it used to be. Whatever you defined it previously, it's different now. It's more than the sum of its parts in the age of digital. I think we heard that over and over again. Second, a strategy should be able to answer how a business will achieve their business outcomes. In our context, digital is the way to do that, but digital extends to people, operating models, and technologies. And what struck me is how infrequently we're talking about technologies (laughs) in our discussions. It's much more about people and processes and skill sets and attitudes and culture. And, And I think, you know, that we kept hearing that that's just key to strategy kind of related. I think the third thing, um, just strategy continues to need to be agile, measurable, and focused through specific lenses or a lens. Um, A strategy needs focus. Uh, And I think that is a little bit different. I think when, you know, people hear the word strategy, they think it's big and broad. And I think it can be big and broad, but I think what we heard from all of our guests is it still needs a lot of focus. Kim, that goes back to your first point that strategy isn't what it used to be, right? It used to be all encompassing. It used to be predicting the future. And, and to your point, yeah, it's, it's more focused. I think what is to me means a little, little narrower, you know, focusing on priorities and then needs to be agile, which I know I'm going to, I'll comment on later. I'll hold off on that because I think that gets into a a little bit of our now what for this episode. Well, and I think that all supports the final thing that we we keep (laughs) coming back to. Uh, None of our guests actually said this, but uh, I think we brought it up in our season opener that vision without execution is a daydream, but execution without vision is a nightmare. And all of our guests really kind of kept talking about how, yes, you have to have vision. You have to have focused vision. You have to understand what, you know, strategy uh, is and what it needs to do. And it has to be, I think, more measurable. That's what we kept hearing about too. But I think, you know, those were some of the big points that we heard relative to strategy and, and certainly digital, but I think, you know, strategy continues to be a much broader topic. So Kim, I love those four points. Let's, as part of a recap, we'll break each of these apart. And I think we both found some very specific 
parts of the interview, some statements and some revelations that we heard throughout the episodes, throughout the season. So let's tie those off to each of these four and let's have a little bit of fun kind of decomposing a little further and talking about what it means. You want to get started? I think what you're saying, Jim, is we're going to have a clip show. It's a clip show. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Very excited to finally have a Simpsons reference in the podcast here. Yeah. Maybe by the end of this, we'll have a couple catchphrases too, Yeah, but don't hold your breath. So I, I wanted to start out talking about Robert Nelms and, and all of the insight that he brought in his episode relative to the idea that strategy isn't what it used to be. It's more than the sum of its parts in the age of digital. And he talked a lot about how marketing used to be marketing, but now marketing is digital and it's very different than IT and it's sort of this you know marriage of art and science. One comment in particular really struck me as illustrating this evolution of strategy. You know, you hear a lot about this digital transformation. Digital transformation is not a digital team becoming something else. Digital transformation is your business becoming something else. I think Robert really illustrates with his comment that you know, digital transformation is your business becoming something else. And it, it's not necessarily always tied to digital. It's that transformation part. But how did you feel about his perspective? I love his way of sort of finally identifying the relationship between marketing and IT. And that that itself is a transformation. And I think the idea of, of transforming a channel or transforming an experience uh, at the end of the day, it's it's your business that you're running. Your business has to survive. The business has to be relevant. The business itself has to be competitive. And it's not something you just do one time either, right? And I think, again, we'll get to some of this later, but this sort of ongoing transformation to something that can change at will, change as needed, I think is really important. And I think ultimately that is what digital is doing, right? It's just shortening those circuits, Right. So that they're easy to easy to change over time. I thought that was a really. I mean, he's had so many insights. I mean, he's really thought about this for a long time. He's been doing it a long time, and I think he um, gave some of the most compelling explanations of why things can be different with digital, with this adoption of not just new technology but new models as well. His whole point about transformation and, and and what takes a good digital leader, what I heard is it's all about connecting the dots and not necessarily thinking about marketing versus IT, but really making sure that everybody can speak to why. To me, that's all about, and he said it, it's empathy. So the way to transform a business is through culture, which takes empathy. To build an enduring yet agile digital strategy, empathy is a key organizational capability. So I came away with thinking, well, strategy then equals empathy. So how do you start building a maturity model in the digital space to illustrate empathy? Yeah, it was something we've, we've heard about From the beginning, right? It just keeps coming up. And I know there's a couple other clips that maybe I want to share uh, as well. So speaking of empathy, this is the age of empathy in in COVID. And we heard a lot about how healthcare is transforming. Yeah, I thought that was uh, exciting. I was excited to have Tom Swanson on from from Adobe. I know his background, both uh, with and prior to Adobe, you know, really spanned uh, many years and uh, a lot of attempts, I think, at things like telehealth and ultimately this sort of alignment uh, around our, our second point, which is the idea of, of answering the question about how the business will align people, operating models and technology. I think of it kind of kind of building on what we just heard from Robert. But that's sort of a classic people process technology. That's just a concept that, that really never goes away. I think in our our thinking, Kim, you know, we talked about this a lot. You know, it's this alignment of the experience, the operations and technology. And I think a lot of organizations are still getting, we get enamored by what could be like, hey, this is a cool experience. I just had this experience. You know, here's a cool um, UI. Here's a new a new app. Here's a new thing. Um, or here's a new technology. What can I do with it? And we, all, we often forget the operational part. I think a lot of businesses still do. You know, so how do you how do you bring it together? And I I thought those really came together in this clip of Tom talking about the unexpected benefits of telehealth. And so we talk about you know, so COVID accelerated this, not a new concept, but it accelerated. I think this clip gets into some things that he he didn't really expect from the telehealth movement of COVID, the, the COVID telehealth movement. We'll call it that. Let's take a listen. Telehealth is a 
perfect example of shifting the patient, right, or the customer into the center of the engagement model, as opposed to historically what we've seen with our doctors is that their availability, right, or scheduling an appointment is done around their schedule, not necessarily ours as consumers. And what telehealth has done, right, is it has kind of reintroduced the house call in the sense that the doctor is coming to you as opposed to you going to the doctor. And by the doctor coming to you, you're increasing your convenience, kind of access level. And one of the things that I think is interesting that maybe was unanticipated as a result of this shift to telehealth is you're actually spending more time with the doctor, right? We've seen on average that right face-to-face conversation with their patient has expanded from about 12 minutes to over 20 minutes. And I think a significant part of that is that when a telehealth call is scheduled, you both get on at that time, as opposed to you having to get in the car, travel to the doctor's office, spend 10, 15 minutes in the waiting room, maybe filling out forms, you know, updating your insurance information. Then you get taken back into the exam room and maybe you're, you spend another 10, 20 minutes in the exam room waiting for the doctor. And so you're, you know, 30, 40 minutes invested into this experience and have yet to actually meet the person that, you know, you're there to meet. And I think, you know, telehealth has eliminated a lot of that friction and put the, the, the customer in the center of the engagement model, like I said. But it's also freed the doctors, right, instead of having to rush from patient to patient to patient in order to hit everyone who is scheduled, they have more time to actually spend engaging in conversation or engaging in, you know, the personal journey of the patient that they're meeting with through that virtual forum, right? So I think all of that has ultimately resulted in a better experience for both when it comes to kind of routine care. So Kim, um, some, some unexpected outcomes uh, from that telehealth story. What did you think? I think that it's such a great example of how innovation can take on different meanings. So the realization that, yes, it's a better patient experience, and we've probably protected a lot of people from COVID being able to, to leverage telehealth, but the benefits to the operations and to the doctors and to the office staff, to me, that's, a, that's an innovation, an unexpected innovation, and something, to your point, nobody really thought about. It wasn't an intended business outcome, but now that there's seeing the benefits of that, uh, just thinking about how that can be uh, repeated and leveraged in other parts of the organization and across industries is actually pretty exciting. Some of the other unintended benefits, I think of other, I will call it digitization of experiences, you know, is it is because it's digitized, you create first party data, right? You learn more about, you know, habits, behaviors, preferences. Uh, We see this a lot, you know, if you open a social channel, you know, what can you learn? What, you know, you build telematics into your products. What can you learn? Not from the data. Uh, I know we just recently launched a virtual agent with a uh, manufacturer that's just generating tons of insight on the way that, that people interact. So I love those unexpected outcomes and benefits. And I don't know that, that was completely unexpected, but probably had a bigger impact, a bigger lift than expected. Just another closing thought on that was finding this balance, you know, I sort of like the way strategy has changed. And this balance between vision and execution is sort of like thinking of everything. I got to think of everything, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, and mm-hmm. that becomes analysis paralysis and you got to admit you can't think of everything. You know, so how do you put agility in, in learning into your strategy, into your design process? You know, so I think, I think this is a good example of that, you know, so let's prioritize uh, what matters. What matters is protecting the patient and, but let's have enough room in the approach to learn and adapt. So I I think there's a lot there and a lot of lessons in how to do strategy differently. Yeah. Learn and adapt, learn and adapt, and and really maybe lean into the things that are working that you didn't necessarily think would work, which brings us to the next, I think, really um, exciting and relevant 
interview with John Gregory from Spotify, which was all about retail. And this is a notoriously an industry that does not learn and adapt. They're always looking backward, generally speaking. It's very hard for any uh, one brand to look forward and take risks. Retail, it's just really hard to do given the business model and the margins. So John, I think, brought some really important points in thinking about how retail can adapt and shift their strategies, really, though, by using a more specific and focused lens. Uh, So you've seen in the age of direct-to-consumer, a lot of other competing brands or legacy brands try to be all things to all people uh, just to make their numbers. And what they realize is a diminishment of the brand value they lose market share, they uh, experience really poor customer satisfaction. So John talked a lot about how he sees the future of retail, but I think in one particular quote, he says something really salient about having a point of view. It comes back down to creative merchandising, making sure that your company is, has a, a point of view. You're not just selling things. You have some something you're standing behind, whether it be service or product or the uh, uh, events in the store, whatever it may be, have some point of view and make that your call to action for your target audience. So why I think that clip is so salient and so important to strategy, whether it's digital or not, is again, that point of view, focus on something, focus on something that you stand for, that you can stand behind, that you can gear all your people, process, and technologies towards so that you do have a little bit more latitude to take risks and see what some of those unintended benefits come from taking those risks. He talked a lot about creative merchandising, and I think in the retail space, that's that's certainly important. But think about how that can uh, extend to other categories and other, in other industries. Yeah, I, I agree. And in different audiences, too, because I think, Kim, the, there's maybe a new frontier here where that, that purpose is important to the, to the employee as well. And, um, you know, people want to work for a brand that, that has a, a mission and a purpose, you know, and people want to buy from a brand that shares, you know, their, their values and, and purpose as well. So I see, I think we're seeing that come around to kind of a 360 purpose. And uh, we're seeing that trend quite a bit, actually, in a lot of our, our clients as well. So um, I think we're going to see more of that. It's probably a whole other story arc for us to talk about. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've always talked about strategy needing to be agile and measurable, but I think uh, John really helped, I know, me understand that Really, in trying to differentiate, a lot of brands still try to be all things to all people, and that can't continue. Uh, And I think your point about the employee experience is really just as important as the customer experience. And I think it's even more important to to acknowledge a time of recording. We're not out of the pandemic yet. And I think in the past few weeks, we started hearing this phrase, the great resignation. I think this is just a great illustration of why brands can't try to be all things to all people. You end up uh, losing focus. And that's apparent to not only your customers, but your employees. So you have to stand behind something. You have to align to it. You have to you know, be all in and use that as your strategic lens. Well, Kim, I'll pick up on that and go right into our, our fourth point in around strategy, which you just, because I do think it goes back to just to jump ahead, just about the decision making and again, balancing vision and execution. You know, we say this a lot. Can we, we love this phrase? There's a few catchphrases we love. We didn't, you know, this is not ours. This is actually a Japanese proverb. I'd love to know more of the background to it, but it's just so relevant. Again, vision without execution is a daydream. Execution without vision is a nightmare. If you haven't been through this, right, it, at some point in your career or on a project, or in your life, you know, it may be hard to grasp, but, but if you've been through the nightmare part, you'll never forget it. Right. So I think the first part sort of self-explanatory, you know, we know that vision is great, but it's navel gazing, right? It's, if you don't do something with your idea, there's, there's no, there is no outcome, like great idea, love the, love the concept, love the pitch, but you know, where, where is it? Show me the money. Where's the beef, you know, submit like what, what's happening? <laughs> what, what do I, what, what do I get? When do I get it? You know, people get that. But the second part is, is sort of counterintuitive because I know we all want to jump in and it's sort of a, there are a lot of cultural norms where, you know, just getting stuff done is sort of emotionally satisfying. I'm like, Hey, I got, look at me. I got started. Like I'm doing something 
And I'm that way too. You know, I'm, I, I want to see visual progress. I want to see change, right? But it can get frustrated, you know, that just there wasn't enough planning. There wasn't enough empathy. There's not enough understanding of the problem. You know, and to me, these are like bad decisions around maybe puppies or relationships, right? Seemed great, to, <laughs> seemed great at first. Did we really think this through? And so, um, you know, I think that's the, the, the tricky part is, is finding that balance. But I do think it comes down to good decision making. And I want to I want to use this clip from Andy Hunt at Hershey. And this will kind of set up our next story arc, too, which is his definition of innovation, because I think it kind of leads into this concept of really strategy being real and innovation really being really smart decision making. Let's take a listen. The way that I, I approach innovation and, and, and the we take a look at innovation is the idea that it's a you're looking at a new idea or a solution to a problem that delivers that scale to its audience. And that's a pretty pithy and short description there. There's a lot, lot to unpack there. What it b- basically means is, is, a, is, a, is a new solution. Again, it's going to deliver to uh, a lot of people that are interested in that, in that uh, particular solution. I used to use the, the, a descriptor of creative in terms of what the, the solution needed to be, but that tends to, to, to narrow the definition just a bit and at least a lot to interpretation for how an individual would define what creative really is, but it's a, it's a new idea that, that you can deliver to people, you know, in the space that we operate in, we tend to do, you know, a lot of experimentation, a lot of, you know, bench work, if you will, and we have a lot of very interesting ideas, but it's not really innovative until we can show it off to, to people and then figure out how to scale it so that it actually applies to, to, to real world problems in a large, meaningful type of way. So Kim, what, uh, what stuck out there for you from Andy? I think that, you know, Andy is a veteran in this space, the space being being charged with innovation. And I had this uh, conversation with somebody the other day where he was like, how do you do innovation? And, and I was really struggling. I'm like, I don't think you do innovation. I think it's a result. Um, sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's an accident. So I, I really like Andy's perspective that, it, you know, he he treats it a lot more intentionally, that you know, solutions can be something that solves a problem in a large, meaningful way. And I like his thoughts on the durability that like it might be a splash in the beginning, but what's the durability of and And that's really what makes it, in my mind, an innovation because it's durable, it's lasting, it, it stands the test of time. Uh, you might have to evolve it a little bit, but the foundation, the core of the thought is still there. Right. And I think, um, I also think, and we'll touch on this a lot in, in upcoming episodes, but, you know, back to the point about finding balance and, and sort of exploring and answering the big questions, you know, what, what should we do? Why should we do it? How does it work? You know, when, when is the right time? Who's, who's going to be impacted? Yeah, I think those are all the, the dimensions that inform these decisions, right? Make them better decisions. Make it foundationally sound, make it durable. Yeah. And durable. Yeah. yeah I was going to, I was yes. going to go back there. Durable. I think we also talked about resilience, right? So that's a that's that's another point. But yeah, things that uh, things that are things that are great and always stay great. So Kim, we pulled this whole strategy arc together. I think we've uh, I think we found some verification and we found some validation around some of those principles. But um, so so now what? I think we both have a couple of perspectives on what to do next and what what our listeners can do. Yeah, I think my big takeaway of this whole arc, um, and I mentioned it before, execution versus strategy. The principles of a good strategy, I think, remain the same. But when you get into operationalizing strategy, which again, is, is it execution as a strategy? I, I think what I kept hearing over and over and over is either explicitly or implicitly the need for empathy. The only way you can build an executable strategy that keeps everyone aligned, on board, enthused is by building empathy. So to me, this is going to be key, uh, regardless of whether you say strategy or execution, you have to build up your organizational capability for empathy. Uh, That was my biggest takeaway in terms of uh, execution versus strategy. That, That capability has to be in both areas. Yeah, I totally agree. And we've, we've, we just keep hearing this so much, but I think one of the things that makes a strategy itself durable is its ability to change and adapt. And we do know that empathy is not a one-time effort, right? Your, the markets change, preferences change, tastes change, you know, people learn about things, try new things, and we're willing to 
adapt uh, to the way that they do things because the pandemic, one more time, uh, has really accelerated a lot of that adoption. I still think about strategy as being uh, a basis or a system for change. So you, you, know, you build empathy, you make smart decisions, but you set yourself up to be able to change your mind, to make more decisions, to make better decisions, to make different decisions. So, uh, and I, I talk to, to teams about this a lot. It's not, why should I change? You know, sometimes you have to convince an organization that they need to make a change. But more often, it's what changes will I make? I, I think we find that every organization now knows that they need to constantly evolve. Um, and so the question is not, do I change? It's what changes will I make? And I think strategy done well, done right, is that system for change. Yeah. And, and I think more importantly, how, because how ends up hitting people process technologies, you know, and gives people that clear direction and alignment. But what I would say is, uh, how does this all come together? The other theme that we kept hearing over and over this this year, I think, is innovation and how innovation is defined. What is innovation? What's not innovation? You know, do, is innovation uh, something that's recognized uh, out of the gate? Do you set a strategy to be innovative or is it only a year after something comes to market that you realize, wow, that was really innovative? Yeah, I want to. I want to insert a joke that you know maybe I innovate so that I can be more digital, so that I can improve my strategy, so that I can innovate more. See the see the <laughs> continuous loop. I don't think it works. Yeah, I think Kim. I think we. I think we need to sit down and think about this one because, right? Because I don't think it's that I simple, agree. right? And it is one of those, as Andy Hunt called it, one of those white noise words. So, yes. Why don't we get Why don't we get together next time and break it down? Let's see if we can tackle this and. And then ask our guests to ground it in the real world and, and see where it goes. Disambiguate innovation. That's a pretty lofty goal. Mm, sounds like a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Bumper sticker? Yeah, we ha we haven't know. gotten into merch yet. Maybe that's a meme? good next step. Yeah. It's at least a meme. We are, yeah. we are digital. Awesome. Well, hey, Kim, great conversation. Thanks for doing this. And um, let's see where innovation takes us next. Yeah, thanks, Jim. You've been listening to What If So What, the digital strategy podcast from Proficient with Jim Hertzfeld and Kim Chopek. We want to thank our Proficient colleagues, J.D. Norman and Rick Bauer for our music today. Subscribe to the podcast and don't miss a single episode. You can find this season along with show notes at Proficient.com. Thanks for listening.